Quantum Rabbit, a Franken Sound podcast. Hello, thanks for tuning in again. This is part two of a series called Australianiality. I think I even said that incorrectly for the whole episode last time. I was calling it Australianiality, which is kind of harder to say and it's probably just not correct. So listen to that episode first. But if you haven't, then just refresh your memory on our friend, the artist Matt McVeigh. There's a lot of the conversation in art that I find very regressive. It's not, we think we've been this progressive time, but we're actually talking about breaking down identity boxes by placing people back in those boxes. Matt's putting together the exhibition Australianiality. See, I almost did it again. Australianiality. Matt describes it as a mongrel word, Australian, with a very special term, lian, in the centre of it. With the word lian being in the space, we had permission, you know, and I understand that, but it was very important that that word sat austral, being southern, Lian being a Yari word, which to me there's a universal word in lots of Abri- I mean, Noongas call it Warren, that spirit. But I also like the poeticness of it sounding a bit like Australian and reality, like a state of transition. We're not there. It's Australian reality. It's a mongrel word and an Aboriginal word right at the centre. And it's actually something that we should have all, we should all be learning to listen to the First Nation mob. And I thought it really empowered that word, but it was political. There was a lot of Noongar people that were like, we don't really want that word used for the exhibition if it's opening up on Wajuk land. Wajuk land covers the area more or less surrounding Perth in Western Australia, and Yaru land is just up the road about 2,000 kilometres in the north. And south of Broome and east of Perth lies a huge area known as the Western Desert region. It covers about 600,000 square kilometres. The traditional people from that region were some of the last to make contact with European Australians, as late as the 1950s and 60s. And even today, English is often a second or third language to many of them. Let's hear from somebody else involved in the project, Western Desert artist Curtis Taylor. I grew up in Bijanaga and I was born in Broome, so, you know, old Yarrow country, and Lian is a Yarrow word, and grew up hearing that word and hearing other words from that area, and that my old people from the Western Desert took their words and understood them, you know, and so we had to, because if we're living on other people's land, then we will have to learn their language and their culture and their ways, you know. I mentioned in the first episode that this exhibition is being supported by the Janet Holmes Court Gallery. The collection and exhibitions manager of the gallery is also the curator of this project, Sharon Tassica. I began working for Janet in 2006. 2008, Janet took sole ownership of the art collection, um, so it was no longer part of Hatesbury, the company. Janet is a very well-known West Australian art collector and philanthropist. The more Janet sees it developing, the more on board that she is. And the more she's talking it up with everybody that comes into the place. And so Are you implying that she I wasn't really... fully on board at some <laughs> point? All right, Janet is fully on board, but Sharon is really skippering this vessel. Australianiality was born in conversation with Matt and also um, Jade, who was working for Department of Aboriginal Affairs. So it was the three of us that started off the conversation. Curtis Taylor came into it a bit further down the track. I've seen some of Curtis's work before at the Fremantle Arts Centre. It was pretty intense. In that show, we made spears, you know, talking about trade. So we were trading these objects, but we were also trading stories and our friendship and everything that comes with connection with another human being. Did one piece where I had, like, just blood on the wall. Yeah, it was so in my own blood, and I really wanted to speak about connection and my bloodline from my father, from my family, because I had this, you know empty wall and I really wanted to do something with it. Births are messy and I hope even if this sex, I mean I'm not going to say this exhibition is going to answer anything, it's going to raise a lot more questions than it answers, it always was going to and I hope that people are encouraged to be a little bit, have some balls and and stop being scared and, and be the bridge, don't be the divide. Another artist involved in this project is French born Australian photographer Martine Perret. So, you know, I migrated 20 years ago uh, in Sydney, but then I was away for 10 years working for the UN. So I was away for a long chunk of that. 
And I came back five years ago and settled in Margaret River. And this is where I really started thinking about this whole idea. And, uh, Martine has photographed a lot of UN peacekeeping well, missions in conflict like, zones, yeah, like, yeah, places yeah, like Burundi, yeah. South Sudan, yeah. the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and West Africa. But her current project involves travelling to the goldfields region in Western Australia, along with her photography, which is pretty amazing, by the way. Check it out. The link's in the show notes. She's also been shooting video and recording the stories of local people. And this is going to be incorporated into some work that she'll be showing at the exhibition. Working with my Aboriginal friends in the gold fields may actually made me think about the whole thing. And all of a sudden I viewed Australia in a complete different way. It was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is what I've been missing all of this time. Maybe the person that I've met now, it, she's the key elder of Laverton, really, because uh, sadly a lot of elders passed away in Laverton. The last trip was about 10 days, and I recorded her in language, telling her life story. So Martine tells me that doing what she's doing doesn't always make for a comfortable situation. Sometimes she finds it difficult to understand people. She's not always sure she's picking up on all the cues, and sometimes she's not even sure she's welcome. So she'll drive for hours out to Kalgoorlie to talk to somebody, or maybe not talk to them, depending how it pans out. It's seven hours drive. <laughs> well, actually, it's ten and a half from Margaret River. I'm not really sure if he's committed to the project or not yet. I thought he was, but then now I'm having doubts. That's why I'm going to Cal to actually meet him face to face. He may be completely willing, or I just don't know I have, I, I'm not able to take the cues, so I thought, right, I'll just jump in the car and just go to Kalgoorlie and solve that one. So Martine keeps driving, and she's not afraid to make mistakes here and there in order to have the conversation. I probably did major blunders, like cultural mistakes, but it, it, was, it ended up very funny. There was this day where I kept insisting on her because I know she's done some dance in 2000 and I said, oh, I really would love to see you, de even if you deconstruct some of the dance, it doesn't have to be perfect. She looked at me very puzzled and eventually <laughs> she confessed, she said, I don't want to dance, I don't want to... I don't want to meet anyone. And I said, well, who says you, you have to meet anyone? I'm just... But then all of a sudden I paused and I just realised for her dancing was maybe meeting someone, like, you know, attracting maybe a man or something. So we were in a complete uh, different world when we were talking. Her idea of dancing was way different. And I looked at her in shock and we laughed. There is an artist called Elizabeth Durack. She lived up in the Kimberley. And she started creating paints under the name of Eddie Burrup. And she entered them into Aboriginal exhibitions. Yeah, and she won a couple of exhibitions. I've seen these paintings. They're amazing. But... A lot of people say it was deceitful. I can understand that because she sold them. No one knew who was the author and everyone assumed it was a Kimberley man, but it was a woman who was white. But she lived in the Kimberley for many, many years. And if you actually understand the cultural paradigm, within their culture, you can actually be a shape, sh shape shifting, you can embody the spirit. And she believes she embodied the spirit of an Aboriginal man and painted from that point. And actually some Kimberley mob, if you bring it up with her, they have no problem. But the rest of Australia had an issue with it. And then the Institute of Art definitely had a problem with it because it's a problem if white people start claiming they're Aboriginal and painting these stories, you know? In the case of Turek, from what I listened, it would be interesting to ask those, you know, people that kind of, if she sat around other mob that was painting at the time or if she was alone. So it would be interesting to hear... You know, those more from the Kimberley and how they saw it. You know, did she go out to country with them or did she sit down with them? She was, I don't know, was she immersed in that community? Uh, I don't know the history of the Jurak family and Mirang Gijamob up that way. Like my angle on that whole kind of situation is in Western Desert tradition anyway, we're really critical of telling other people's songline. Uh, stories we always keep in within our boundaries you know wherever the song lines start from on the coast you know you gotta have those coastal people telling it and then once it reaches or ready to come to your country in the ceremony then you gotta be ready to be there to receive it and take it on 
and sing it through your country and then give it on to the next mob. I was down at a friend, Larry Foley's, um, Danny Fremantle. He's a collector and a dealer and um, became a bit of a mate over the years. And I was wandering around his house just looking at all of the stuff that he had there. I looked up at a painting on the wall and I said, is that an Elizabeth Durack? And he said, oh, actually, Sharon, that's an Eddie Burrow. And he had two of them there. I think Elizabeth may have gifted one to him. I went out to the car and he followed me out and he had wrapped up that Eddie Burrup and he gave it to me for Janet's collection and I accepted it. We had other Elizabeth Durax in the collection and I just thought that is part of her story, part of her work and so we now have an Eddie Burrup in the Janet Holmes Court collection. I accepted her feeling that she embodied the spirit of Eddie Burrup, whatever that meant, whatever that meant to her. I spoke to Curtis about some of the work he's bringing to the exhibition, and he surprised me a bit with this one. It's a painting. Based around a pornographic film, a gay pornographic film that, you know, uh, really enraged a lot of Indigenous people across the country because they use uh, didgeridoo as a sex toy in their movie. So, yeah, I painted one of that. So, the scene, a scene from a movie, yeah. So, it's a scene from a movie, not your movie? No, not my movie, no. And is it Aboriginal people in the movie? Or? Uh, just I think just two white guys. Two white guys yeah. using a didgeridoo for... Yeah, as a sex as toy, a sex toy in, the, in one of their scenes. And I haven't it, seen the movie yet. What did you like about that idea that made it worth painting? Uh, I guess because of the whole kind of stuff that came out of it, like the rage, and you could see people were really pumped up and really wanted to talk about um, why that's really offensive and, you know, stuff like that. I think on ABC Tom Ballard show was comedian Craig Quarterman talked about, oh, you know, you know, this is just a plastic kind of pipe and, you know, there's no cultural significance. It's just, you know, the dude shoving a pipe, really, I guess, at the end of the day, up another man's bum, yeah. Um... But yeah, it was like this kind of whole nonsense around the rage and also kind of seeing it as a, I guess for me, the comical side of, you know, the whole feeling around that when the news broke. I'm looking forward to seeing the painting. We'll hear more from Curtis next time and meet some other people involved in the exhibition. Meanwhile, send us an email, say hello, and thanks for listening.